There often is, moreover, a striking resemblance in those accompanying exercises and circumstances which are not essential. Awakened sinners are liable to the same erroneous conceptions and usually fall into the same mistakes. They are all prone to think that, by reforming their lives, they can restore themselves to the favor of God. They commonly apply to the works of the law for relief. In the first instance, and when driven from this false refuge by a clearer view of the spirituality and extent of the law and the depth of their own depravity, they are apt to give up all for lost and seriously to conclude that there is no hope in their case. They are all prone to misapprehend the nature of the gospel. Of its freeness, they can at first form no conception, and therefore they think it necessary to come with some price in their hands, to obtain some kind of preparation or fitness before they venture to come to Christ. And when it is clear that no moral fitness can be attained until they apply to Him, this legal spirit will lead the soul under conviction to think that very deep and pungent distress will recommend it to Christ. And thus, many are found seeking and praying for a more deep and alarming impression of their sin and danger. It is also very common to place undue dependence on particular means, especially on such as have been blessed to others. Anxious souls are prone to think that in reading some particular book or in hearing some successful preacher, they will receive the grace of God which brings salvation, in which expectation they are generally disappointed and are brought at last to feel that they are entirely dependent on sovereign grace and that they can do nothing to obtain that grace. Before, they were like a drowning man, catching at everything which seemed to promise support, but now they are like a man who feels that he has no support, but is actually sinking. Their cry, therefore, is now truly a cry for mercy. God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Lord, save, I perish. And, it has often been said, man's extremity is God's opportunity, which is commonly realized by the soul cut off from all dependence on itself. The arm of the Lord is stretched forth to preserve it from sinking. The Savior's voice of love and mercy is heard. Light breaks in upon the soul, and it finds itself embraced in the arms of the Savior. And so wonderful is the transition that it can scarcely trust to its own experience. This similarity of feelings in the experience of the pious has often been remarked and has been justly considered a strong evidence of the divine origin of true Christianity. For how otherwise can this uniformity of the views and feelings of the pious in all ages and countries be accounted for? Enthusiasm assumes a thousand different shapes and hues and is marked by no uniform characteristics. But scriptural piety is the same now as in the days of David and Asaph, the same as when Paul lived, the same as experienced by the pious fathers of the Christian church, the same as described by the reformers, by the Puritans, and by the evangelical preachers and writers of the present day. When the gospel takes effect on any of the heathen, although it is certain that they never had the opportunity of learning anything of this kind from others, yet we find them expressing the same feelings which are common to other Christians. People from different quarters of the globe, whose vernacular tongue is entirely different, yet speak the same language in Christianity. Members of churches which hold no communion and which perhaps view each other when at a distance as heretics, often when brought together, recognize in one another dear brethren who are of one mind in their religious experience. But the identity of religious feeling is consistent with a great variety in many of the accompanying circumstances. 
Indeed, it seems probable that each individual Christian has something distinctly characteristic in his own case, so that there exists as much difference in the peculiar features of the inner as of the outward man. The causes of this diversity are manifold, as first, the different degrees of grace received in the commencement of the divine life, secondly, the extent to which they have respectfully run in sin, and the suddenness or gradual nature of their change, thirdly, the degree of religious knowledge which is possessed, and finally, no small diversity arises from the various constitutional temperaments of different people, which must have a powerful effect in giving complexion to the exercises of religion. To all which may be added, the manner in which people under religious impressions are treated by their spiritual guides, and especially the manner in which the gospel is preached to them. It may, however, be laid down as a sound maxim that in proportion as the truth of God is clearly brought to view and faithfully applied to the heart and conscience, the good effects will be manifest. Erroneous opinions, although mingled with the essential truths of the gospel, will ever tend to mar the work of God. The good produced on any individual or on a society must not be judged of by the violence of the feelings excited, but by their character. Men may be consumed by a fiery zeal, and yet exhibit little of the meekness, humility, and sweet benevolence of Jesus. Great pretenders and high professors may be proud, arrogant, and censorious, when these are the effects, we may, without fear, declare that they know not what manner of spirit they are of. Any religion, however corrupt, may have its zealots, but true Christianity consists in the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Piety seems also to assume an aspect somewhat different in different ages and periods of the church. There is in human nature a strong tendency to run to extremes, and from one extreme immediately to the opposite. And as the imperfections of our nature mingle with everything which we touch, so piety itself is not exempt from the influence of the tendency just mentioned. In one age or in one religious community, the leaning is to enthusiasm, in another to superstition. At one time, religion is made to assume a severe and gloomy aspect. The conscience is morbidly scrupulous. Things indifferent are viewed as sins, and human infirmities are magnified into crimes. At such times, all cheerfulness is proscribed, and the Christian whom nature prompts to smile feels a check from the monitor within. This alloy of genuine piety is also often connected with bigotry and censoriousness. Now, when true religion is disfigured by such defects, it appears before the world to great disadvantage. Men of the world form their opinions of the nature of piety from what they observe in its professors, and form such an exhibition of it as we have described, they often take up prejudices which are never removed. There is, however, an opposite extreme, not less dangerous and injurious than this, when professors of religion conform to the world so far that no clear distinction can be observed between the Christian and the worldling. If the former error drives men away from religion as a sour and miserable thing, this leads them to the opinion that Christians are actuated by the same principles as they are, and therefore they conclude that no great change of their character is necessary. It is sometimes alleged by professors who thus accommodate themselves to the fashions and amusements of the world that they hope by this means to render religion attractive and thus gain over to piety those who neglect it. But this is a weak pretext, for such conformity always tend to confirm people in their carelessness. 
when they see professors at the theater or figuring in the ballroom, their conclusion either is that there is no reality in vital piety or that these professors act inconsistently.